Good morning. Good morning, Bikers in Church. Let's try it again. Good morning, Bikers in Church. Good morning. Yay, so good. It's Jesus' day. We get to praise him all together, and I'm so excited that you're here. They gave me a few announcements to tell you. One, we have coat racks now, so if you have a coat, you can put it on the coat rack or put it in your chair, but don't let it hang over the back. And also we have connect cards, fill that out. If there's something that you need us to pray for, please fill that out so that we can be praying for you. And also, I hope that you grabbed communion. And if not, there's some on the back of the chair so that you can have communion with us. Today we're gonna to talk about prayer, so let's start praying already and let's talk to the Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this day and we praise you and we thank you for breathing breath into our lives today so that we could come and worship you. It is only because of you that we can do this. We thank you for um, the life that you've given us and we pray, Lord, that you would be blessed and pleased by all that we do. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Stand and worship with us. Caught up in your presence. Oh, I just want to sit.
presence of the Lord this morning. We are about to go into this song um, called Overcome, and there is a line in it that says, for every fear, there's an empty grave. And so as I got to thinking about that this week, I started doing a little research on how many times in the Bible it tells us to fear not. And I found out something really cool. It actually tells us to fear not or do not be afraid 366 times in the Bible. That is one for every day of the year, including those years with a leap year. And so how cool is that, that through his word, God gives us a daily reminder to fear not because for every fear, there's an empty grave. He has overcome and has covered every fear we could ever have through his death, burial, and resurrection. Amen? Amen. Amen. Sing this with us. studying the seven Hebrew word um, that uh, makes up the English word praise. And we wanted to share one of those words with you this morning. It's called yada. And it means to worship God with extended hands. And I know that can be a little bit uncomfortable sometimes um, just to extend your hands, but doesn't our God deserve it? We just sang a song that he overcomes. He overcame the grave 
We have no fear in life. Um, we can trust him. And so that word yada is a reverent response to God in worship to extend our hands in praise to him. And I just want to encourage you guys just, even if it's a little uncomfortable for you, I want to invite you to extend your hands in worship with us this morning because our God is deserving. Amen. Let's continue to worship our powerful God. Father, 
Thank you so much that we can be together in a time of worship and listen to a message. And I pray, as Jeff brings us message today, I pray that um, it brings us encouragement. I pray that it brings us wisdom so that as we go forward into the world and, and into the week that we're able to um, take this, in, this with us and um, touch others' lives. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Well, we're continuing on our road trip through the Gospel of Luke, making stops along the way during Christ's final weeks leading up to his crucifixion in Jerusalem. Today, he wants to teach us how to pray. One of my favorite stories about prayer comes from author Tony Campolo. He was getting ready to speak at a, a chapel service at a, a nearby Pentecostal college, and eight men took Tony to a back room of the chapel. They had him kneel down, they laid their hands on his head, and then prayed for his message that day. Campolo said that while the prayer was a good thing, that they prayed a long time, and the longer they prayed, the more tired they got, and the more tired they got, the more they leaned on him. And he said it wasn't so much fun having eight Pentecostal preachers leaning on you. To make matters worse, one of the men wasn't even praying for Tony. He went on and on praying for somebody named Charlie Stolfus. Dear Lord, you know Charlie Stolfus. He lives in that silver trailer down the road a mile. You know the trailer, Lord, just down the road on the right-hand side. And Camp Paulo thought, yeah, I'm sure God is taking notes. What's that address? Lord Charlie told me this morning that he's going to leave his wife and three kids. Step in. Do something, God. Bring that family together. And finally, the prayer time concluded. Capallo spoke for the chapel service. He got in his car to drive home. As he drove onto the Pennsylvania Turnpike, he, he noticed a hitchhiker. And although he wasn't usually his custom to stop, he, he picked up the man. Campolo said, we drove a, a few minutes, and I said, hi, my name's Tony Campolo. What's yours? The man said, my name is Charlie Stolfus. <laughs> Campolo couldn't believe it. He writes, I got off the turnpike at the next exit, and I headed back in the direction from which we had just come. The passenger got a bit uneasy with that and said, hey, mister, where are you taking me? Campolo said, I'm taking you home. The man's eyes narrowed and he said, why? Because you just left your wife and three children, right? That blew him away. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. And with shock written all over his face, he plastered himself against the car door and never took his eyes off me. Then I really did him in as I drove right up to his silver trailer. When I pulled up, his, his eyes seemed to bulge as he asked, how did you know that I live here? I said, God told me. <laughs> and I did believe God did tell me. When he opened the trailer door, his, his wife exclaimed, you're back, you're back. And then he whispered in her ear, the more he talked, the bigger her eyes got. They cut Paul said with real authority, the two of you sit down. I'm going to talk and you're going to listen. And man, did they listen. He said that afternoon I led those two young people to Jesus Christ. And today that man is a minister in California. But that story illustrates two things for us about God. First, that God has a great sense of humor. And second, God answers our prayers often in ways we never could have imagined. The, the context for our study today, if you turn to Luke chapter 11, is where Jesus is repeating the model prayer teaching that he had given two years earlier at his famous Sermon on the Mount. The disciples made the request to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And it was a startling request because as Jews, the disciples had grown up with a lot of prayer. It was offered throughout the day at meals 
at the beginning of the Sabbath when they went to the synagogue, they weren't just asking what words to say, but they had noticed how Jesus looked forward to prayer. He actually hungered for it. They saw that somehow prayer fed Jesus the way that food fed their stomachs. He had this richly interactive life between him and his father. And they noticed at crisis points that when Jesus was grieving over the death of John the baptizer, or when he experienced need, or when he was tired from ministry, his consistent response was to pray. And they wanted to be nourished by prayer the way Jesus was. And so they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus gave the model prayer, not as a magical incantation to get God's attention. It was intended for more than just a weekly recitation and a worship service, but it was a template. It was a pattern with some key components found in a powerful prayer life. The followers of Jesus wanted to learn to pray like Jesus did. Would you like to tap into that power of prayer? Amen. We need to learn to pray like Jesus taught us to pray. The first requirement is to pray with purpose. Verse one, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place and when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said that when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. The prayers of Jesus were hollow recitations or empty words lacking substance. They weren't the vain repetitions of the Pharisees that he had warned against. They were purpose-filled communications of Jesus with his Father in heaven. And the model that he taught contained four components. If you want to jot these down under point one, the first component is adoration. Our Father, hallowed be your name, honored, revered, respected, holy be your name. Next is supplication. Give us this day our daily bread. Supply what is needed. And then contemplation. Forgive our sins as we forgive those who have hurt us. And then a declaration. Lead us not into temptation. Christ's prayers were direct. They were succinct. They were concise. He taught the 12 and he teaches us to pray with purpose. <coughs> As we read on in Luke 11, the next instruction was for us to pray with persistence. And that's the lesson we all need today. Our, our impatient approach to prayer is often one and done. Have you ever thought, well, I prayed about that once, but nothing happened. I think many of us suffer from a spiritual ADHD. We're unable to concentrate or sustain our requests for very long. We have attention deficit disorder with a generous portion of hyperactivity thrown into it as we rush from activity to activity and we have difficulty waiting on the Lord to accomplish things in his time. Let's continue in our text. Let's go to verse 5, Luke 11. Listen to the example that Jesus gave. Then Jesus said, suppose uh, you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A, a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked. My children and I are in bed. I can't get up. And give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, 
Yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Shameless audacity means your boldness, your stick to It lets our Father in Heaven know how serious you are about the request. Let me ask you, if you could ask God to answer one prayer in your life, for what would you ask? And the follow-up question is, do you now regularly, diligently, every single day bring that request before him in prayer? This example of persistence teaches us to continue to pray faithfully for the long haul, persistently. And that's how George Mueller prayed. George Mueller of Bristol, England was a a man of prayer, a man of faith. He writes in his diary, in November, I began to pray for the conversion of five individuals. I prayed every day without a single intermission, whether sick or in health, whether on land or on sea, whatever the pressures of my engagements might be. He prayed for five friends to become Christians. 18 months elapsed, he said, before the first of the five was converted. I, I, I thanked God and then I prayed on for the others. Five more years elapsed and then the second was converted. I thanked God for the second and then I prayed on for the other three. And day by day, I continued to pray for them. And six years passed before the third was converted. I thanked God for the three and I went on praying for the other two. These two remained unconverted. And he said, the man to whom God in the riches of his grace has given tens of thousands of answers to prayer in the selfsame hour or day in which they were offered, speaking of himself, he said, has been praying day by day now for nearly 36 years for the conversion of these individuals. And yet they remain unconverted. He said, I hope in God and I pray on and I look for the answer. They are not converted yet, but they will be. And this was the faith that carried him through every need. It, in that emergencies by asking, and, and in due time, God supplied whatever the need might be. And, and so how did those prayers end up, you ask? Well, these two men were sons of a friend from Mr. Mueller's youth, but they were not converted after he had entreated God on their behalf for 52 years daily. After his death, God brought them in the fold. Don't quit too soon. Continue to pray for that loved one to become a Christian. Continue to pray for that family need. Continue to pray for that problem situation even if it takes 5, 10, 15, or 20 years, keep praying. The Lord teaches us to pray with purpose. The Lord teaches us to pray with persistence. And finally, He wants us to learn to pray with passion. Pray with passion. We're taught that in verses 9 and 10. Not a passive approach to prayer, but pray with passion. Asking, seeking, knocking on heaven's door with purpose and faithfully with persistence. And we return to Luke 11 and verse 9. Jesus thought, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks the door will be open. When I was in high school, I, I preached a, a portion of a three-point sermon with two of my friends uh, on a youth night at Bridgetown Church of Christ. Bill Geiger preached on Ask and It Will Be Given. I spoke on Seek and You Will Find. And Mark Morse concluded with Knock and the Door Will Be Open. Ask and It Will Be Given. For everyone who asks, receives. 
Jesus, the half, James, the half brother of Jesus reminded, you have not because you ask not. James 4, 2. I'm not in agreement with the, the health and wealth gospel purveyors who claim that God wants you to be physically healthy and materially rich. That, that's an American suggestion that doesn't surface among Christians and in, in other cultures of the world. That's how the gospel has been Americanized to appeal to us. I, I do believe that God often wants to provide us with gifts from heaven that are already wrapped and label for us, but we never bother to request. Down in, in Luke 11, verse 13, it goes on to tell how as good fathers want to give good gifts to their children, that God is a good, good father who loves to give gifts to his children. Listen to the timeless principle of Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. When we ask for things that are consistent with God's will, he wants to give them to us. Seek and you will find. In Acts chapter 17, verses 24 through 27 tell us, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. And he does not live in temples built by hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. And then listen closely. To the next verse. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Seek and you will find. Everyone who seeks finds. If you are genuinely searching for God, you can discover him. He is not in hiding. He is a loving father and he is pursuing you, his beloved child, if you are lost. So be open to God and be open for God's direction. Popular British worship leader, Matt Redman, tells of a time, he said a few years back, Mike Pilavachi and I were invited to Norway for a ministry trip. And at the time, Mike had a fear of flying and he insisted on us taking the ferry instead of the plane. So unfortunately, what would have been a mere 40 minute drive to the airport and a 90 minute flight, it turned into a six hour drive to the ferry, followed by a 26 hour sea crossing by boat. Redden says, not that I'm still bitter. Uh, adding to my nightmare, he said the only thing to do on the ferry was to play bingo, so it was a very boring trip. To cut a long story short, and I mean long, I arrived in Norway in a very bad mood. <laughs> Finally, we arrived at the youth meeting. It was one of those tough meetings where everything in worship seemed to be a struggle. I, I tried lots of different approaches to try to connect, but, but nothing seemed to, to cut through. Everything bombed. No one really entered into worship, and I felt myself sinking. Suddenly, a song entered my mind. It, it was though a prompting from God. It wasn't the sort of thing that I was wanting to hear at that moment. And instead of hearing a, a fresh, spontaneous line that would miraculously draw everyone together in worship, all I could think of was the Michael Jackson song, You Are Not Alone, which was currently on the chart. I sensed a little whisper telling me, sing that song next in the worship time. Redmond played on and said, I'm not doing that to myself. I said, I'm embarrassed I even thought of it. I he said, it, it wouldn't go away. And so soon I faced up to the fact that actually things 
could only get better, not worse. So against my better judgment, I, I launched myself into the chorus of this song, struggling to guess the chords as I went along. You are not alone. I am here with you. He said it was a terrifying moment. The minute I started this song, I thought, what are you doing, you idiot? You're meant to be leading worship and you're doing a cheesy acoustic cover version. He said, I can only imagine that it's what it feels like when you walk a, a tightrope. Once you start a walking, there's no way out of it. The only thing you can do is keep going and, and, and don't look down. So I shut my eyes. I, I hoped for the best. And I wondered when the next ferry home was. <laughs> After the meeting, when I was head down packing up my guitars, a, a group of teenagers came up to me. As it turned out, they weren't Christians. And the Michael Jackson song had been the only entry point into the worship for them. We ended up playing through some other pop songs together and had a bit of a chat. And by the end of our few minutes together, I could see that their attitude about church had changed a bit. Thank you, Lord. I thought at least something good has come out of this. As they were leaving, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a lady coming up to me in tears. I stopped to speak with her, and as she told her story, I soon realized that, that God had been working all along. She said, I came to this meeting tonight in a terrible state. I've traveled six hours to get here, all the way crying out to God, why have you left me all alone? God, you've left me all alone, and I'm desperate. I'm going to this meeting as a last resort. I need to hear from you. I need to know that I'm not alone. And that concluded, when I had sung out, you are not alone. I am here with you. This lady had broken down in tears and God was answering her desperate prayers in a very direct, personal way. Be ready and open to God. Seek him and you shall find him. He wants to be actively working in your life every day. That's right. And knock and the door will be opened. And to him who knocks, the door will be open. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. We are permitted and commanded to access God approaching his throne of grace with boldness. What gives us this unlimited access? It's because we are his children. Hebrews 4.16 directs, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we, we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Well, let me suggest doing a, a prayer walk through your neighborhood or practice drive-by prayer. Pray for people in the houses as you travel. Pray for those where you work. Pray when you're shopping at the mall. Uh, honey, I'm going to be gone for a few hours. I'm going to Florence to pray. But <laughs> ask the simple question to people you encounter during your day. How may I pray for you? It's a, a rare individual who would refuse your prayers. There's a deep need in everybody's life that even a resistant non-believer will often say, well, I guess it can't hurt anything. I don't believe in God, but why not? Sure, if you want to pray for me, have at it. It's the perfect opportunity to plant a seed. You're telling others you'll pray for them. It's the same as telling them, I care about your pain. And I believe in a good heavenly father who also cares for you. What do you think could happen? Well, the Bible says in Ephesians 3.20 that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. 
So pray with passion. Let me give you three quick take-homes that will guide you this week in praying with passion. First, pray constantly. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 commands us to pray continually. To constantly be in this attitude of prayer. Make your spare moments prayer moments. While driving, serving, cleaning, resting, walking, biking, texting. Move in and out of a conversation with God all day long. Develop that constant attitude of prayer. It doesn't mean walking around all day with your eyes closed and your hands folded. Prayer is an interaction of the mind with God. And we can move in and out of prayer all throughout the day. And it's prescribed as an alternative to worry. Are you facing some tough stuff right now? Of course you are. Do you have some pain in your life that is weighing you down? Sure you do. Everybody does. The Apostle Paul, who knew something about suffering, suggests prayer as an antidote to anxiety. He tells us to pray constantly. Philippians 4, 6, he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. In the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's consider another adverb. Pray courageously. Prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. Living life on mission means that we pray for the opportunity to, to tell other people his message. That's it. That becomes something we begin to ask for from God. God, give me the opportunity today to, to tell people the good news. Isn't that really why we're here? Isn't that what we're supposed to be? His witnesses? And so we pray for our friends. We pray for our families. We pray for our work associates. We pray for the people we know so that they may find what we have found. You know what happens when we start praying for the opportunity to share the gospel? We start seeing more opportunities. Make a written prayer list and record the names of those you care about. It makes us aware. Not only does it have us rely on God in the process, but it keeps me thinking about those people for whom I am praying. The FBI has the, the 10 most wanted men list. In my desk, I, I have a similar list that I am seeking to guide those individuals toward making a commitment to Christ. I've borrowed the title from the FBI. I, I call it the 10 most wanted list. And beside those names of men and women, I write the date when that individual committed his or her life to Christ and, and was baptized. And then I add another name to the list and begin to pray. And some of you have been on that list. And some of you are still on that list. One final adverb, pray collaboratively. Michael Jordan's highest scoring game ever was March 28, 1990 against the Cleveland Cavaliers. Rookie Stacy King had been drafted by the Bulls and he played in that game that Michael Jordan scored 69 points. <laughs> Stacy King only played 17 minutes. He took four shots, missed them all. He made one of his two free throws after he was fouled in the act of shooting. So his grand total for his performance that night was one point. A few weeks later, a, a reporter was interviewing Stacy and asked him, tell me, what's your favorite memory uh, as an NBA player so far? Without blinking, Stacy said, my favorite memory is the night when Michael Jordan and I combined for 70 points. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Yeah, as we each live out our daily mission to, to love God, to love people, to impact our world, we're, we're trying to guide people to heaven. We may make a free throw every now and then, but when God shows up to score 69 points, our combined effort wins for the kingdom. 
That's the power we have available through prayer. When I was eight years old, while returning from vacation at the Wisconsin Dells, our family was involved in a very serious car accident. We were traveling in a downpour on a two-lane highway in Illinois, and our car was struck in a head-on collision by an oncoming car which hit standing water, lost control, and came into our lane. My mother's injuries were the worst. She had a severe skull fracture that severed the, the nerve to her right ear. And vomiting and hemorrhaging accompanied her condition, and I had to grow up very quickly that day. As we waited for the emergency units to arrive at the scene, I prayed aloud for her as I had never prayed before. I poured my heart out to God, and I begged him to spare my mother's life. Prayers from all over the country went up on behalf of this young minister's wife. Many years later, the very first time that I met Jesse Smith, he told me that on the night of our family's car accident, the prayers were lifted up from Bright Christian Church at a Wednesday night prayer meeting on behalf of my mother. She spent a week in the intensive care and two more weeks in the hospital in Illinois before being able to return to Cincinnati. A few months after the accident, she chronicled her experiences. And I wanna read an excerpt from the pages that she wrote at that time as a 31-year-old mother. The only thing that I've been able to remember after the crash was Jeff's praying for me. I've never heard anyone pray like that. He could see the blood and was old enough to know I was hurt. He agonized with God and begged him to help his mommy. Now when I look back, it was very humbling. This was all inside the car while we were waiting for the ambulance. When I started remembering Jeff's praying for me, I kept telling the nurses about it and how thankful I was that we had taught our little boy to pray. Gotcha. Parents, grandparents, it's never too soon to start teaching your little ones to pray. You never know. It might save your life. It can definitely save theirs. Lord, teach us to pray. Our Father, we thank you for this gift that you've given us, this privilege of having unlimited access to you 24-7. Today, my prayer is that we leave with a deeper appreciation for this gift and that we will use it in a larger way in our lives as we go forward serving you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand right now? Today, if you need to make a response to the Lord, we invite you to come forward and we'd love to talk with you more.
Do not let your hearts be troubled. There we go. John 14, 1. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And then Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. I find a lot of comfort in those verses that we know where we're going. We have confidence in who our God is because Jesus came down, fulfilled all prophecies and died on the cross for us. He was the only one that could do it. He was the only one that could live a perfect life because he was our savior. He is our savior. So that's why we take communion every week because we don't wanna take it for granted. We don't wanna just go through the motions. We wanna be impacted by what Jesus has done for us. So go ahead and peel back that first layer. We'll take the bread remembering Jesus's body that was broken for us. Peel back the second layer. Drink the juice, remembering Jesus' blood that was poured out on our behalf. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for being the awesome God that you are. Lord, I thank you for your son, for the sacrifice that he made. Lord, I thank you for being our constant, our foundation, our solid ground, that we can rely on you no matter what, no matter what this life brings. Lord, we have hope in you. We have hope and joy in what you bring to us. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. We're going to continue with worship. So if you guys would stand and sing with us.